Hey, Lauren, what an amazing job on season two. I absolutely loved it. I cannot wait to finish it on Friday. Now, uh, look, how do you handle taking inspiration from the books and the stories as the story further uh, progresses along in season two? You know, we always go back to the books as our main source. Um, you know, we also knew, though, that Blood of Elves, which season two covers, was going to be a particularly difficult book to adapt um, from the very beginning. It's a book where there's a lot of beautiful character moments and things happen, um, but there's not a lot of forward moving plot. It's it's more about setting the table for, you know, the third book, The Time of Contempt, the third season as well. Um, so we knew that we would have to inject some new stories in there. We always try to make sure that our stories match the tone that Sokovsky intended, though. That's our most important thing. And that's the thing that he asked me to do at the very beginning, which is to represent the spirit of the work more than the actual page to page itself. So right. Yen's, Yen's story, for instance, um, in Blood of Elves, she kind of is gone. She's just disappeared for the first half of the book. She's like recovering from the Battle of Sodden. She's been blinded. You don't really know what's going on. And then she shows up because Geralt calls to her. And I just thought, I don't think our audiences are going to like her just waiting in the wings for that phone call. Um, so we crafted a new story for her. But I think especially people who love the books are going to be able to find a lot of direct like page to page correlation uh, to the novels. It's amazing. Now, how will series uh, powers evolve and how does that shape her relationship with Geralt this season? Oh, so what I love about Siri is that her powers are completely unknown to her. It's one of the most interesting things because she has these powers. We actually see her, you know, obviously accidentally kill people at the end right. of season one. And she's trying to keep it a secret because she, in her mind, that's bad. And she doesn't know how to control it. And what's really interesting is it becomes the basis of her trust with Geralt, which is, is she ever going to tell him what she's done? It, does she think that she's going to be punished? Does she think that he's going to abandon her, you know, much like she was abandoned for season one? And that really becomes the core of their relationship, which is how do they start to trust each other? And to me, it's so it's so beautiful. And through series powers, she starts looking into the person that she wants to be in the future, not just the person that she was in the past. Right. Now, how do you view the relationship relationship between Geralt and Siri? And can you talk a little bit about the themes of found family that echo throughout the course of the season? Absolutely. So I thought it was really interesting in season one to establish Geralt and Siri within their own spheres. So Geralt was a witcher and Siri was a princess on the run. And that's really all that they were. They didn't feel like they needed anyone else. They certainly didn't want anyone else. And even though they were destined to be together, they have that hug. And then as you see in the first moments of, of season one, they're like, wait, who are you? How do I trust you? What do I do? Um, so as I said, you know, it's really about growing their trust. And Siri doesn't have any family left. And we right. went back and forth on the show about whether the tone was more um, older brother or more father figure. But I have to say, I leaned personally toward father figure because there's something so paternal about how at first Geralt only wants to protect Siri. Um, right. And then he starts to teach her how to protect herself. And that feels like such a fatherly trait to me. And this is the core of our story, you know, and Yennefer obviously comes into this at the end as well. She's had her own story about who is her family? Can she have a baby? You know, what are those, what, what is she looking for in that way? And when she intersects with the two of them, you know, we finally get this, this found family together. Absolutely. Speaking of found family and father figures, uh, we get to meet Vesemir for, for this first time this season. Um, now, I saw him obviously in the anime, uh, got to explore him a little bit. Uh, can you talk to me about how the Witcher anime Night of the Wolf kind of uh, will play into season two at all? Oh, absolutely. So I think there's a really sort of simplistic way that it plays in, which is just Easter eggs, of course. You know, when Siri and Geralt first arrive at Kaer Morhen, there's a huge griffin skull in the uh, in the bailey that they go through. And of course, anyone that has watched the anime knows that the griffin plays a huge part in the fall of Kaer Morhen. But I think it's more than that. I think, you know, Kim Bodnia, who plays Vesemir, always joked about how much fun young Vesemir had, um, right. how Theo James played him. It was, it was delightful. But we realize um, at the start of season two that Vesemir has an innate sadness to him. There's something missing. Um, we purposely built Kaer Morhen to be this huge, spectacular space, and then we put very few people in it. So from the get-go, it feels lonely and empty. And you understand that Vesemir is yearning for not just what the witchers were in the past and what his sons were in the past, but he's really striving to find like what 
what role do witchers have in this world? So I think that if you've watched the anime, you understand where that sadness comes from in a truly, you know, in a deeper level. Amazing. Well, Lauren, I love season two. It is amazing. Thank you so much for your time. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great to chat.